So our first speaker of the day is Johan Kestens. Uh, Johan is the Chief Information Officer and member of the Executive Board for ING Bank Belgium. Can we get a huge round of applause, please, for Johan? Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you for being here. My name is Johan. I run IT for Belgium and a couple of other countries I'm also responsible for, like Luxembourg. Um, I came here today for two reasons. First, I'm an engineer who's already a little bit more of the vintage type. Um, my first girlfriend was a Commodore 64, and uh, they wanted me to keep in touch a little bit with the sign of the times. Uh, we heard some Ziggy Stardust music earlier on, and um, that's a bit of my uh, epoch. So I'm very happy to be here, uh, to listen and learn from you, uh, what you care about, and that's very good. The second thing is, I have prepared for you a talk which is about 18 slides, and with a bit of luck, it's like 35, 40 minutes. And then we can have some Q&A. I know there are some loose mics going around, so then uh, maybe have a bit of dialogue, not too much listening, but really dialogue. And I think that's important because the presentation I'm going to share with you was designed for a really classical audience. It was shown to the Belgian CIO community whatever that may mean. It was shown in London to the IT risk conference, whatever that may mean, and also in New York. But today, I wanted to test the street credibility of the story. And the story is not about ING and how great ING is, because you wouldn't be here if you did not believe that ING would be something interesting. It tries to create perspective and context. There's not a lot about real techy stuff. I have some colleagues like Hank and Ferd who can tell you about uh, data lake engineering, open standards, uh, transformation in IT, biz DevOps. You learn a lot about that. But what I will try to do is by looking back and looking forward, connecting the dots to see where technology could be taking us. You ready for it? Okay. Now, where does the title come from? Digitalias. It's a contraction. It's a contraction of digital and alias. And the meaning is that alias means there's actually not that much new, but it's a lot faster, a lot better, a lot more profound, and in a certain way also a lot more difficult. That's what I'm trying to go explain to you. People talk about disruption. And disruption is happening everywhere. But the disruption in itself is not so much that we come up with totally new things. It has much more to do that we deliver old concepts in a dramatical new way. And what is different is the speed, the scale, and also the life cycle. Life cycle is getting extremely cramped, extremely short. And so all of that creates a new set of challenges. And those I want to share with you, the way we see them. Let's take a step back. There are a couple of things in technology which are extremely quite powerful. And I happen to believe, and I'm not the only one, that the technological progress is really the key driver in society progress. I once talked to the um, conductor of the New York Philharmonic Orchestra. And what he said was, he said, the Greeks have figured it out. The Greeks figured out in their tragedies, and Shakespeare, by the way, as well, in how the human condition is working. What are the classical conflicts that you can have? Love, hate, envy, power. But what really changed is technology. So here's about IT. All of you know Moore's Law, but if you apply Moore's Law for 25 years, it means that your processing power for the same lay, euro, or dollar increases by a factor 100,000. In memory, 
it's even a lot more. If you take the same time span on memory, performance for a monetary unit increases by a factor half a billion, 500 million. Networking, bandwidth, same numbers, 60 million. And then there is a little footnote that I added myself, which is half of that, or much more of that, uh, technological progress is eaten away by the complexity of the software that we use. If you look at 1986, the basic operating system of an IBM PC was 312 kilobytes. If you look at Windows 10, it's 12 gigabytes executables and it comes with 20,000 drivers. It takes two hours to boot on one of these really powerful uh, PCs that we have. So you give a little bit away because technology solves a lot of these, this stuff for you in the background, but it creates quite some overhead. And you will see in the talk that I believe this overhead uh, will slow down at some point in time certain elements. Most industries have been seriously disrupted already, but I would argue they have been disrupted not because of technology, but because of something happened in human nature, enabled by technology, that changed the paradigm. I start with photography. Digital photography has been around for 30 years, and it has been for roughly 15 years a specialist trait, mainly for sports photographer, who could spend 10,000 euros on equipment to take action pictures of sports. But the real disruption came when a mobile phone started to have a camera. That is when it changed. And what changed is that people took a lot of pictures. In the old days, taking a picture was an expensive thing. You thought twice before you took a picture. Today, people take about 80 times as much pictures as they used to do 20 years ago, 8-0. They never look at roughly 80% of the pictures they've taken. It has become a commodity driven by the power of what I said to you before, the memory. And the implication is that, for example, in Western Europe, 80% of all photoshops have gone. Second, advertising. Basically, Google is in the advertising business. All of you might believe you are Google customers. You are not. You are the raw material. Your behavior, your search uh, behavior, is the raw material that Google is transforming into information to price advertising. Google is doing many other things. I know there are Google people in the room. I hope you don't feel offended by my um, uh, perspective on it, but that's what it does. So what do you see? Print advertising is down by 50 to 60%. Classified have all uh, ads, which was the big money maker for all sorts of newspapers, radio stations as well, has almost died. And what is very funny, is that radio is the only old medium that is holding out. And that probably has something to do with the fact that people still don't have a good way to listen to something in the car uh, compared to the alternatives they have um, uh, on the internet. Book publishing. So in the US, 70% of all bookstores disappeared. 70. They're coming back now. But they're coming back in a different way. They're not coming back as bookstores, they're coming back as experience centers. You can browse for books, real books, you know, things on paper that you can open up and so on. But you can also have a cup of coffee, you can dialogue with friends, there are writers that are coming to give lectures, so it becomes much more an experience because the classical concept has been killed both by Amazon and by Kindle. Music publishing is a bit the same. And it started in an illegal way until Steve Jobs convinced the industry that you know, it could be done in a downloading uh, way with the iTunes store, but now Napster and Tinder are taking over and streaming becomes the norm. And the only reason why that can be done is because there is enough bandwidth and memory to support that. 
it would be blatantly impossible 10 to 15 years ago because we just didn't have the technological oomph to keep that going. Same is happening in travel, same is happening in taxis. There's nothing new fundamentally around Uber. The only thing it did was it killed the waiting time experience and has a much better software than a traditional taxi company that has maybe you know, 1,000 taxis driving around in Bucharest. So that's quite important, and it will not stop here. I really believe, for example, education will also go dramatically through a disruption. Because if you have the type of media that you have here, why would you go to an average colleague if you can have a Harvard professor on the internet? And if you can submit your student work um, uh, through the internet, and it can be reviewed by some of the best tutors in the world. So what you see is that the best survive, and everything which is mediocre is really under pressure. It is really an acceleration of uh, the pressure on all sorts of industries to really outshine. And this is also where a lot of the thinking of the Singularity University um, comes from, uh, with Ray Kurzweil, uh, who's the chief scientist at Google, promoting this. But what I'm trying to say is that about 30 years ago, all of these concepts existed already, but they were very clumsy. Uber was already there. There was there's a company called Taxi Stop, and you could go there, and you could get a ride to anywhere you wanted, Rome or Madrid, but it took three days to get it arranged. In hotels, there was this little uh, company called Logis de France, which allowed you to go anywhere and get discount rates and so on, but you had to have the guide in your pocket, you have to have a membership card, and they only got, for example, in terms of quality rating, one visit per year, while with Airbnb, some of the people get on average 100 reviews per year. The same is true for books and music. Everybody knows the classical library, which on average has 7,500 titles on stock. And if you go to Amazon, of course, you talk about a totally different number. The same is true for TV. And what is very funny is that one of the oldest social functions in life, which is drinking, which used to happen in a pub, is now being transposed to Twitter uh, and reduced to 140 characters and the alcohol you have to get from your own fridge, I presume. But what is really happening is that technology and the internet is disrupting all sorts of uh, fundamental uh, elements of life in a sequence. It started with a shopping experience, and you can see that, for example, photos, pictures, music, software, everything which was easy to digitalize became available for distribution in a digital format, and that was the first wave. The second thing is, people realized you don't need a middleman anymore. And this is why 80% of all travel agencies in countries like the UK disappeared. This is why Photoshop's disappeared. This, and you don't realize that because it might, you don't see it on a day-to-day -day basis. But I give you an example. Financial intermediaries, independent financial intermediaries in a country like the Netherlands have been decreasing year on year by 10%. So one year, you don't see nothing. There used to be 13,000. The next year, there are 12,000. You still see plenty. But if you take that for 10 years, 80% of them are gone. And this is really going on. I sometimes tell this joke, you know what the best business is to go into if you want to open a shop, a physical shop? It's the barber business, to get a haircut. Because it's about the only thing that hasn't been figured out yet, how to deliver online. And you will laugh at it, but take a look around. In most cities, the number of barber shops and beauty saloons has tripled in the last 10 years. Now we have the next wave, which is powerful search. I, used to re I, I remember reading in the newspaper that private equity bought yellow pages for the amount of five billion. Today, they would not even pay five, because Google and the relevant search companies have taken over that business. 
And the same is happening in brokers of all kinds. Uh, search today is really coming to your fingertips. And the only limitation that you have, basically, because most of us are not very good at that, is how precise is the question that you ask. Because if you don't ask a good question, you don't get a good answer. And it's really something worthwhile to, to try and exercise a bit. The sharpness of your question determines the quality of your answer. But most of us have never been trained in you know, putting the right query into that. The next thing that came along was people started to, do, to leverage free capacity. Yeah, and that is a bit where the Ubers come from, the Airbnbs. You know, if I have a spare room, I can make the occasional uh, little bit of pocket money from it. And this was only possible because software made it easy to organize the availability of free capacity in, let's say, a market of half a billion people. Because you cannot organize it if you only have two. The cost is too high. Or if you only have 20 or 200 or 2,000. But you can organize it with software if you have 2 million. You need a sufficient market to really create that. And what is then happening is that you get co-creation. And co-creation is actually quite old in software. But what you now see is that it also happens in art. I myself am the proud sponsor of a company. It's called Pop Positions. And what does Pop Positions do? Well, it goes to all these big art fairs, like Brussels Art or TEFAF in Maastricht or the Basel Fair. And it shows up in places like this with avant-garde artists. And it basically feeds on the traffic of all the people that come to the real art fair. They go to the art fair, then they say, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, what shall we do? And they pay a visit to pop positions and meet new artists that would never get in the traditional art fair. I think it's quite exciting. And it's really a pop-up concept. That's why it's called pop positions. And the only thing is, don't go there to buy beautiful things, because the audience is those people who really think differently and who buy because they want to be different. If you find very weird things there. I, I don't even dare to describe it on this stage. The next thing that's going to happen is monitoring. And monitoring, all of us know that you have these wearables, you have property surveillance. But what people don't understand is how powerful it can be. I will give you one example, drones. The killer app for drones would actually be to survey agricultural land and to monitor how well fertilizer is spread over agricultural land. And why is that important? Because it has been scientifically proven that if you can equalize the fertilizer over the land in a very good way, you can increase the yield by a factor five. This is dramatic. Right? So if you would have, imagine a piece of land, one acre, and you would have perfect fertilization, you could have five crops a year instead of one. And you can imagine what that could do to further fight things like you know, the, the food uh, situation in developing countries and so on. But for that, you need drones, because they're the only ones who can really see the unevenness in the fertilizer in the country, plus the software to figure out how much fertilizer is really optimum, because you know if you do it the wrong way, you exhaust the soil, and so on and so on. But so this is where measurement can really be really helping society forward. The final thing we're going to see is that robotics is going to hit. And we can see today that surgeons, surgery is increasingly done by robots, still under human supervision. But the reason why I believe that robots will eventually take over is because, first of all, they have predictable quality. Second, they work faster. And this matters in surgery because the, the tinier the wound and the, the shorter the time of the opening, the faster you heal. Plus, robots do not hang, hang, they do not have hangovers. They do not sleep poorly. They do not uh, fight with their partner the night before. And if you would know that the, 
heart surgeon which is going to operate on your heart would have had a bad night the night before, I'm pretty sure you would be a lot more nervous than if you wouldn't know that. But ultimately, it sounds a bit like a joke, but the predictability in these critical circumstances is quite important. It might take us a while to get to the, let's say, maturity that it's really good, because imagine a robot saying, okay, uh, my script is uh, corrupted, I'm not gonna make a 10 centimeter cut, I'm gonna make a 10 meter cut. You don't wanna have that, of course. Eh? It needs to be really reliable, but at the end of the day, with sufficient development and maturity, we will get there. And the same then will happen with your home being connected, with smart cities being developed, and you've all read in the newspaper what that means. So there we come to the Internet of Things, which is a fantastic thing with, because of today you have already more than two billion devices going from cameras, refrigerators to whatever connected to the net. But I want to urge a word of caution here. Everything new will bring great benefits and also new risks and dangers. I'll give you an example. Last year, there was a blogger who offended the hacker community in North America. And uh, the hacker community decided to teach this guy a lesson and to block his account. They were able to mobilize so much power in the Internet of Things, they just diverted the camera, the image from my doorstep or your doorstep to this guy's uh, blog site. Google had to intervene and try and help, and the hackers brought down one of the six key nodes in the Internet in North America. This meant that about 140 million people on the U.S. East Coast did not have Internet um, for, let's say, the better part of the day. Now imagine that you are being operated upon at that very moment uh, by some robot who has just downloaded an upgrade in a software and the internet is gone. So this is a, a really quite a, a dramatic thing. Privacy and data sharing are the same. I think you've all read these articles whereby even in your smartphone, well this is not a smartphone, but imagine it is, um, you know, People can take control over it and observe you without not knowing it. And this might be quite innocent. Depends a little bit on how you live. It depends a little bit also on how good this is. But I think most people would be really disturbed if they would know that that could happen and that it might come back to them in a moment or circumstances that they don't like it. And privacy is a very difficult concept. What exactly is it? Where are the boundaries? We can spend the rest of this day debating it and not finding any answers. But the technology is so powerful that we are really confronted with the fact that we don't really know how to behave vis-a-vis -vis it. And then finally there is storage. More and more we're relying on digital storage, but many of us know that if you haven't booted a hard disk for let's say three to five years, you're not really that sure that it will come on in the right way. We have good experience and a big learning curve with how to preserve books. And if you go to the Vatican, they will tell you it's very difficult to maintain these old manuscripts and you need to control the humidity and all that bizarre. But they can do it. I don't think we know how to preserve digital information for more than two or three hundred years because it's not that old. And we don't know very well how all the storage media uh, will behave. But we create so much content that it will be really a massive challenge to keep whatever we want to keep available in the next couple of centuries. Algorithmic business will be quite important. Google is an example of an algorithmic business, but there are many, many more. And I already explained the reasons why. They work 24-7, they're never ill, and they can also learn from past experience. And the predictability is quite good, because one of the worst problems in many industries is the fact that you don't really know how good the outcome will be. Algorithms will stop that. But it's also very dangerous. What if they go the wrong way? Yeah? We've all seen that uh, movie, I think, Dr. Strangelove. And it can also be a single point of failure. I already explained that in the story of the internet being brought down. 
Nevertheless, algorithms will be a key driver of business and come to many areas that we've never expected before. They're already there in health. Uh, you can buy today software that tells you what to eat at what point in time during the day and so on, and it will not stop. The only bottleneck is how much brain power we put to it. So let me now zoom in a bit on the financial industry. And in the financial industry, a lot of talk has been ongoing on fintech. And fintech is a, a, quite a wave of um, financial innovation and startups that has been ongoing for a number of years. So people often ask me, are you not afraid of being totally mar marginalized in terms of fintech? And the answer is, I'm not. And there are a couple of structural reasons why this is the case. The financial industry, because I've often asked myself, why is Google not opening a bank everywhere in the world in one year? They could do it. They have two billion customers. They are on every screen. I'm sure they have the engineering power to do it. And I believe at one point in time, the fact that banking is a regulated industry, and by the way, a highly regulated industry, with very tough um, policies, is also, to a certain degree, a protection, uh, so that tech companies are a little bit afraid of going there, because there's quite some bureaucracy if you want to really be a big and good bank. And there are very many complex processes that have been established in banking and that really have a lots of ins and outs that most of you don't know about. I give you an example how corporate actions go. Does anybody in the room know what a corporate action is? So corporate action is, for example, if you own stock and the company says, you know, I'll pay you a dividend, but you have two choices. You either get it cash or you get an extra share. You can choose. So you have to talk to each individual investor who has to then say, I want this or I want that. And it's a very intricate choice, completely electronic, and nobody, unless those that work in that industry, really understand how that goes. It's the deep plumbing of the financial industry. And that is very, very complex, and that is also one of the reasons why banking is actually um, in pretty good shape today. That does not mean that fintech will not bring innovations. They will. In that area that they understand very well, the user experience, things like payments, transactional business. And the reason is that for transactional business, you don't need that much capital. It's pretty simple to design a user interface that transposes itself in front of any existing payment system and this is what you see. This is where PayPal is coming from. And what you see is that most fintech companies focus on two things. One, they take one example of a customer experience, and they really do that in a very good and innovative way. And the second thing is they offer tools to banks to themselves become a lot better, be it in security, be it in uh, management of uh, user data. There are many applications possible. So what you see is that the fintech industry tries to cherry pick a little bit in the financial industry what is, uh, what is available, and that the financial industry, the banks, are collaborating with fintech industries, either by partnering or sometimes by just buying a startup to deploy the technology uh, that is being offered. And this is leading to a much more digital driven banking industry, whereby the the bank actually becomes a digital company, be it that it also has advisors for those complex matters that are still too difficult to tackle by algorithms or where people do not feel at ease to trust algorithms. And so at the end of the day, the power of having a balance sheet and 40 or 50 billion of equity is quite a reassuring thing for those that uh, need to take out big loans or those that need to make big deposits. And, but that does not mean that we do not need to transform. And if you see what is happening today, 
we see dramatic pickup, for example, of online and mobile banking, um, and that really becoming the mainstay of our business. So it's a bit of a mixed answer. I'm not that afraid of the fintech industry. I see it rather as an opportunity to get new ideas, to really improve the business, and to get to a more digital outcome. But it's quite interesting what has been happening over the last 10 years. A number of companies changed the way we all think about using services. What Apple said was basically, I take away the problem that things are complex. Anybody re still has a TV at home with a remote control? An old TV with a... How many buttons are on the remote control? A lot. A lot would be north of 40, right? Yeah, yeah, so a bit more than 40. And how many do you have on your uh, uh, smartphone? Two, three, on off, a uh, bit of volume, that's it, right? And you know, uh, the new Apple phone doesn't even have a docking port anymore for earphones. So, um, but, but that means, and, and Steve Jobs actually stole the concept from a German company called Brown. Anybody remembers Brown, the shavers and uh, so that, that was Bauhaus design, and Bauhaus is about a century old, had the philosophy of really simplifying things to the max. And if you read Steve Jobs' biography, or if you watch the movie, you will see that he tried for 20 years to hire the chief designer of Brown. He never succeeded, the guy wanted to stay in Germany, and that's how he ended up with Jonathan Knife. Uber, Uber dealt with lack of patience. Uber says, I don't want people to be impatient. And they did that very well. It comes at a price. If you try to get a taxi in San Francisco when it rains, you will see it's about five times as expensive than on a sunny uh, Sunday afternoon. But you don't have to wait. So Uber says, you know, Apple says, I will kill complexity in user interface. Uber says, I kill patience, or lack of patience. And Netflix says, I will give people choice. Amazon says, I will remember what you like, and therefore I can make good suggestions to you. Google says, don't worry, I can answer any question. I don't know how relevant the answer is, but I can answer it. And Tesco tries to mingle it all so that you, know, you can order something online and pick it up at the petrol station. And if you've forgotten something, there's even a delivery man coming to your home and saying, here's your can of milk that you should have ordered, but you didn't. So, and, and, but that means that we are really becoming a bunch of spoiled kids in terms of you know, things should be easy, ubiquitous, choice should be abundant, and I want to be remembered for what I did in the past so that I don't have to explain what I want. It's fantastic. What it also did for the financial industry, it raised the bar. We have to become a lot better than we were. And that is what we're currently working on in terms of offering these type of benefits to our customers. I want to talk a little bit about digital money based on blockchain. Because digital money based on blockchain, I believe, could be really a transformational element. If you think about banknotes, what is a banknote? It's an IOU to the central bank. You carry a banknote? That means, you, what is it, a Romanian banknote? Okay, so you owe, the, the central bank of Romania owes you money. And that banknote is proof of it. And it has all sorts of funny things. It has a watermark, it has a hologram, it has metal in it, it is printed on special plastic, because it can be forged. And blockchain can take away all of these problems away, because blockchain, by its continuous hashing, carries a memory. So it's, a, it's as good as a physical banknote, but even better. I can determine who owned that banknote at what point in time. So if I would be a central bank, I would really love to control this technology because it's the future of how you print money. And money is based on trust. If you don't trust the banknote in your wallet, you will throw it away and there will not be an economy. And so these new technologies will likely really change the way we think about money 
but there are also implications. So imagine you can determine who owned which banknote at what point in time. There is a certain part of the economy that would not like that very much. So this will create also a lot of fiscal transparency. But I predict that it could take a few financial crises, and there will be future financial crises, because there have been in the past. There will be also in the future. The only thing is we don't know where they're going to come from. Um, before we really are there. And then the securities industry, this was my old story about corporate actions, shares, bonds, and so on. They are even more ready to be disrupted. Because some of you may have seen in these antique shops, you can see these old posters, and it says, you know, Anglo Mining Company of America, one share. And it's almost this very artful uh, writing, and they sell for a lot of money. But today it's all computer titles, and what it is, it's basically a blockchain waiting to be done. But you have to think this through. If this whole world is, be is going totally digital, who's going to be the ultimate rating agency? And for those of you who do not know, a rating agency is somebody who investigates a company or an individual and gives it a sort of quality in terms of credit rating. Standard & Poor's is one. Um, and they ask a lot of money for that type of uh, uh, investigation, and it's quite, quite impactful. You all have read in the newspapers, you know, the debt of South Africa has been downgraded to junk. And that basically means that the government of, of South Africa has to pay 3% more per year to finance itself. It's a lot of money, just by that single opinion. But who has the most information to give an informed opinion over time, it could be Google. And that creates, again, a dependency on this huge digital mass of information. So blockchain could be two, three things. One is payments, and the example you all know is Bitcoin. Second, it's a source of truth. Yeah, so uh, there is a profession called a notary, and the notary is basically a witness and a register when you buy a house or whatever you do to do that. It, you could swipe it away. It's no longer needed. Because the Bitcoin, not the Bitcoin, but the blockchain, contains all the necessary information. It goes to the point that in Guatemala, Guatemala never had a land registry. They never had it. If you wanted to claim title to a piece of land, there were two options. One is you said, I own this piece of land, and maybe somebody disputed it. Second is, you hired a bunch of guys in a pickup truck with some guns to make your claim more forceful. That, of course, is not a good situation. So Guatemala said, I want a land registry. They never had a paper one. In Belgium, there is still, well, it's no longer paper, but there's still a building, and you go there, and they tell you, I have a map, and I know exactly who, who owns this piece of land. It's in most countries like that. Guatemala didn't do that. What they did, they went straight into blockchain. So their land registry is now somewhere in the cloud and is keeping track of who owns what in Guatemala. But there is also a drawback. You may have observed that as you continue to use the blockchain, it's getting longer and longer and longer and longer. The first bitcoins today have a length which is superior to the Bible in terms of what they are. And at some point in time, that will become a slowdown. That's the reason why Bitcoin can only do five transactions per second. There are two reasons for that. One is the bitcoins get longer and longer. And the second reason is you have this majority logic type of thing where 99 people or servers need to agree on, on, on what is right, and of course that takes a bit of uh, processing power. And at some point in time that will stop, or that will slow down, and we need to find new solutions. So what are the consequences? And I have four or five and then I'm done. The consequences is to master technology becomes more daunting. And, and let me give you an example, Google as a company. The question they face is how do I 
simultaneously serve 10 or 100 million of users? Yeah, Netflix has the same, uh, same question. How do I return 1 million search results in less than a second? And where do I find rivers to cool my data centers? Because these data centers are so powerful today that, you, that they, they have the same type of um, cooling need as a nuclear power plant. So you cannot do that everywhere. It really becomes something. The other thing Google needs are 20, 20 million reliable servers. So I think that is why they started to produce their own. They had so much demand, so much uh, driven to the point that they said, I'll make my own. Nobody can supply them to me. And then the final question is, what if Google gets hacked? Because they know everything about two billion people, or maybe even more. And I think there the defense is that Google is so big that any hacker to really find the data they need to find needs to be almost as big or have the same processing power as Google. I don't think there's a hacker who can really do that. But this is really, it becomes quite challenging. Eh? The second thing is life becomes very volatile. And what you see is that in terms of which companies are really leading in the world, the period where they can stay in the top position is getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. General Electric used to be there for 10 years. Exxon used to be there for 10 years. And now it's a, a continuous uh, humping over, and most people are only there for a couple of months. And why is that? It is because being a digital company allows you to scale extremely fast. Remember Facebook? Uh, they went in just like eight or nine years from zero to one billion users. But you can also ex decay extremely fast. I have a couple of examples. Anybody remembers in this room Second Life? Yeah? yeah? So people started businesses on Second Life. People created, you know, identities on Second Life with their own businesses. It was thought to become as big as the actual planet. It's gone. For one reason or another, it didn't ring a bell. Anybody remembers Nokia? Yeah? Nokia, about 12 years ago, its market capitalization was 45% of the Finnish economy. 45% of the Finnish economy. And it was then sold to Microsoft, and a part of it is still alive, but it's gone. Sony. Anybody remember Sony? So uh, 25 years ago, when I started my career as an engineer, Sony was the example. They got it right. They did everything. Television, audio, they invented the Walkman. Anybody remembers what a Walkman is? Yeah? Yeah, it, it's, it's this big smartphone with rotating parts in it, yeah? Or, or big iPod, that's a better way to call it. Big iPod with rotating parts in it. It was a revolution in 1984. People, you know, people flew to Tokyo to buy a few and resell them on the streets of Paris. Sony is in big trouble. Uh, apart from the games franchise and uh, the, the movie franchise that they bought, company is really uh, no longer there. So it's a pretty brutal world out there. Big wins, big stakes, but you can lose it quickly. And I want to point out one final risk, and m many of you may not know that. Um, so a big part for us as a financial industry is what is happening in financial markets. And the financial markets are very much driven by the price of money, which is interest rates, stocks, and bonds. And there are tons of people analyzing what is going to happen. And if there are many people getting different opinions, there is this thing called the market, and the market sets the price. It's very important, and if you get it wrong, bad things happen. Ask Lehman Brothers. This was really what went wrong with the U.S. mortgage market. But now something funny is happening. There is this thing called Aladdin. And what is Aladdin? Aladdin is a big computer. It's in Utah, in the United States. 
and it contains a research algorithm. And this research algorithm is used by roughly 16% of all the money managers in the world. That means that all these people behave in the same way. That means that all these people believe that, you know, if uh, this stock is overpriced, they're all going to sell it or buy it. And what it introduces is it introduces dramatic volatility. And what this volatility does is, this is why we have a capital buffer, to absorb it, eh, to cope with that variation. You, you must look at it as a bathtub. If you have big waves, you need a lot of water in the bathtub in order for it not to drop to the bottom. And so my point, the point I'm trying to make is that the behavior of everybody using the same digital means introduces risk into the system, new risk. And that, I think, is something that we have not been able to deal with yet. But it's something quite important to keep in the back of your mind. This is maybe not a very you know, tech-driven argument. But I think it's good that you listen to such an example because it is ultimately the type of dynamics that you will have to include in software that you build or that you maintain. So, you are going to say, well, dear Johan, you've given us this nice talk. How do you deal with that? Because I have a couple of challenges. One is, my business investment cycle is three times as long as, my, as the innovation cycle in the industry. What does it mean? It means I'm always behind. I know if I buy a computer today or a piece of software today or I develop it, by the time it's there, it will no longer be leading edge. I know that. It's a fact of life. So what I need to do is to open up to other parties that can help me to stay sufficiently ahead uh, in technology. The second thing is the use of big data and where we need to understand predictive behavior. We have never learned how to develop these algorithms. So it's quite important that we really put a lot of research and try to understand the true value. And I know there's a talk later on today on how to make that happen. The third challenge is the abundance of data. Uh, you've all seen these stories whereby the amount of data that we produce I think today it doubles also every 18 months. But as a regulated bank, we need to keep those data. So one of the things that you see is, how do we do that? And we need to keep them longer and longer, because society also wants to be safe eh? and wants to be able to inquire what happened a number of years ago in case of um, a terrorist threat or something else. So how do we do that? What, do we, what happens if we would invest in the wrong storage technology? And so what we basically do is we invest a little bit in multiple storage technologies so that we are always reasonably sure uh, that we can cope with the requests for archiving that are there. And finally, and this is the biggest challenge of all, how do we keep our staff in tune? Because what, what, there used to be a time when you learned something at university, you were reasonably sure this was roughly going to be your field for roughly 20, 25 years. Those days are gone. So we have to treat our staff in a, how do we help you to continuously learn and develop. It's quite important. And that is a challenge. Eh, because we transform roughly every five years but it also means that we have, for example, jobs, roles, functions that did not exist five years ago. So how do we select people? How do we help them? How do we coach them? That becomes quite, quite uh, important. Finally, and this is my closing remark, one observation on how to deal with privacy. And you know there has been quite some controversy in, uh, in the financial industry by using data from banking or financial industry for other purposes. And the public doesn't like that, and we have been wondering a little bit, how does that come? And I have a personal theory on that. And my theory is the following. I think people really agree that data are used 
within the context of the engagement. What does that mean? In the context of the engagement means if I go to my doctor and I tell the doctor, doctor, I have, a, I have pain, I want you to describe me something, I don't want that to be used for other purposes, like a pharma company saying, you know, my paracetamol is better than the one of the competition. Because I talk to my doctor in the context of my health. If I go to my banker and I say to my banker, I want a loan, I don't want them to receive a publicity that, you know, this car is better than that car, because I talk to my banker in the context of that. But if I go to Google, and I say, Google, I need a new refrigerator. What's a good new refrigerator? Because Google is not challenging me, I think I suspect Google to send me a little ad on another um, refrigerator. So I accept that because it is part of the context in which I engage. Nobody goes to Facebook believing that whatever they post there will be treated confidentially. It's just not true. So that's what you do. And of course, if you make the wrong trade-off, things go wrong as well. But you expect Facebook to show uh, the information or your pictures to others, your friends, because it's the purpose of it. But the purpose of the financial industry is not to use the data for non-financial purposes, just like the purpose of the healthcare industry is not to use healthcare industry outside the context of engagement. So this is my view why there is this sensitivity. And that was it. I don't know how much time we have left, but I think we have still some 10 minutes for Q&A. Are there any microphones in the room? People may want to react, ask questions. Uh, Michael, you had a microphone earlier, or if you want to ask a question, just yeah, stand up or wave, whatever. There are no questions? Yes. Ah. The icebreaker. Hi. Do you think blockchain technology could be used as a way to unify competing banks in terms of sharing uh, IT costs and stuff like that? Uh, blockchain is used um, by banks in a collective way, there is a consortium, it's called R3, and most of the big banks are in there. Some of the initiatives that are pretty used is, uh, for example, in the um, structured loan market. So some of the loans, syndicated loans, what's a syndicated loan? It's a loan whereby 20 banks say, okay, you wanna b build a big highway in Brazil? cost 20 billion, that's too much for me, but guess what, we're 20 in the room, we each take 5%. And you can trade that. So if I want to get rid of my 5%, I can sell it to you, and you can sell it to somebody else. There used to be what is called a, uh, uh, a syndicate uh, master, who kept track of who does what. Yeah, a little bit like an organizer of the game. That can be done in blockchain, and is currently piloted as being done in blockchain. Um, you need to mic because people cannot hear you. But other stuff like transactions, day-to-day, -day, buying, shopping, that kind of stuff. I believe uh, the payment methods that we have today, traditional debit, credit, online, or even mobile payments are far more efficient than the blockchain. Far more. We, we will never beat that, I think, uh, with the blockchain. Why did you put uh, Tesla on the possible uh, extinct company on a few slides? You looked carefully. You looked carefully because you're right. Uh, no, no, and I'll explain. So about a year ago, because I remember I said uh, I've used this material um, before, there was big doubt whether Tesla was going to make it. More recently, about then, eh? Uh, Tesla has done quite well in terms of meeting expectations, but the jury is still out. If you want my personal opinion, I think Tesla has more potential as a battery maker than as a car maker.
Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you've mentioned the example with the surgeon being replaced by a robot. I, I was wondering, um, it's clear that uh, a human cannot compete with a robot uh, on the long term. Uh, is there a way, I don't know, for humans to make uh, some room for themselves in uh, this robot uh, <laughs> world? Is there a what? Please? Is there any room, you know, for example, can we learn something so that, uh, I don't know, we are still useful in this robot economy? Don't despair. <laughs> no, but there's a very fundamental um, way. Uh, this might get a bit philosophical, but what you often see is that whenever a trend is getting too successful, it bends. Um, and I think we're at the beginning of understanding what robotics can do, and they will definitely be very good um, for structured, um, repeatable actions, but human beings will then adapt by forcing a lot more on creativity and interaction, which is, creativity is something I believe we have not been able yet to teach robots, and in that respect, I think, um, as it has happened in the past, there will always be an adaptation. The question is extremely interesting because we don't actually know how to observe that. I give you an example. I'm pretty sure the structure of our brains is changing by using smartphones. And there is scientific evidence that the way uh, the neurons in our brains is linking, is changing through the use of smartphones. But we do not yet know what that means. Are we becoming visually more um, sharp? Are we losing cognitive intelligence? The, the first thing that you see that is going down is the quality of writing. If you look at how people were writing, uh, let's say two centuries ago, the quality of the sentence building is much better than it is today. And that is because it took a lot of effort. You know, you had this parchment, you had a pen. People thought before they were writing. Eh? And today it's so easy that the speed of the process is not helping the quality of it. But it's something that we really don't understand very well yet because the revolution of the smartphone is, let's say, what, five to seven years old? And I think you need much more experience before you, um, you can conclude something meaningful. Okay? Thank you. I can add something to the question. Maybe I can complete your answer. Uh, our place with robots could be enhanced. For example, as you said, a surgeon can be replaced by a robot, but normally we don't have right now so many sur good surgeons. So with a robot and uh, artificial intelligence, uh, normal people could do the expert job. So I think there is place for everybody and also will be, uh, we will raise the quality of our services. Yeah, I, think, I think it's a very good comment. It, you can see a precursor of what you say in India. So in India, there are specialized uh, clinics and they only do cataract. That's the only thing they do. And the surgeon only does cataract. Uh, but he does it three, four times faster than a normal surgeon who does multiple eye procedures. He's also better because he does only that. But that's one way of standardization, and if you then automate beyond standardizing, that of course creates even uh, a better, um, let's say, outcome. But you're right, and it becomes much more affordable. Eh? This is one of the, the great things that we will see. If we, if we want to have so many surgeons, we can produce. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So this is the good thing about it. The bad thing is, what if the robot goes berserk, right? Starts cutting like that. Nobody wants that. You know the question?
question. Yeah. Hi. So, really said about the fintech industry that it's not a danger for you, or at least that's what I understood from your presentation. What makes you think that doesn't come something like Uber for financial services, which says, okay, we ignore all the rules and regulations, what we provide a high, high value proposition for customers, is not coming along the way in the fintech industry, and says, okay, we, we just provide a lot of good financial services, but without ignoring completely the regulations that a regular bank would have to respect. Okay, so let me be very clear. I, I cannot be absolutely certain huh, uh, that uh, there is not going to be uh, somebody who invents a bank and replaces everybody else. Because I really cannot. I do think it's unlikely. One of the reasons is there are three. Number one, why hasn't it already happened? Number two, it is quite hard to be a regulated industry. And I sit around the table when we talk about capital requirements. And number four, um, have you looked at the market valuation of tech companies compared to banks in terms of um, uh, uh, price uh, market to book and price earnings? I'd rather be a tech company because it's about five times as advantageous as a, as a bank today. But it has high volatility. Okay, I, I believe people are voting literally with their feet at this point in time. So, um, unless there is uh, one last burning question I'd like to conclude, I want to thank you for listening. Go on. Thank you very much.